just in that tea. Psilocybin, LSD. It's just tea. I have eaten some mushrooms. Magic mushrooms? I am hallucinating. I think that there's an aspect of these experiences where you're not afraid of authority and you're not going to listen to authority at a certain point. You now have seen beyond the veil and you know that you're an immortal being and that the state has nothing on you. I mean, you can go all Gandhi and you can be like, lock me up. I don't care. There's nothing here. Yeah. Uh, that's to be not afraid of the state scares the hell out of the state. So to me, I think mm -hmm. that you could see a, a, a convenient reality where entheogens are illegal, psychedelic experiences, taboo and demonized. We'll lock you up for the mushrooms. And the church is happy to be like, yeah, uh, sure. Don't we don't want to go down those roads either. And mm -hmm. we don't value meditation. There's so many things like rites of passage, almost every culture. It's another separate thing that in isolation, they realized or decided we need to have rites of passage around the time of puberty. And a lot of times it is a sweat lodge. A lot of times it is a spiritual evolutionary experience. I think anything that lets us know that we are more than ourselves the state and the church are very willing to just be like, let's, let's cut that out of all these people's lives and the way our system operates. Um, yeah. It's just an, it's just the yeah. way it works. Yeah. And it's always been interesting to me that, um, you know, alcohol has always been legal, but alcohol doesn't, you know, take you into that sort of transcendent state the way entheogens do. Right. Um, it's, it's the, you know, and I guess it's it's gradually changing with cannabis being legal in, in a lot of states, decriminalized in a lot of other states. Even mushrooms are, are decriminalized in a lot of places now. So I think it's a gradual shift. So it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, how it plays out. But then again, there's also the, you know, it's not like if somebody has a psychedelic ex experience, they're, you know, going to become a wonderful person. No. There's plenty of people who do psychedelics who who are not. So. <laughs> well, I do think that's a cultural problem for us that we don't have the set and setting, the shamanism. You know, we're basically doing freelance, uneducated shamanism in high school basements and college dorm rooms. Not recommended. Yeah. You don't need to go to Disneyland on mushrooms. But yeah, I do think that if we restored the, the context it the, the suggestion of the context it, it can go a long way in helping people to integrate and and do understand them as like a medicine and mm -hmm. without that it's just a bunch of kids messing around and you know i'm guilty of that a little bit but i definitely think that if you have a few experiences maybe you have some extremely potent ones or maybe you just have have them later in life i think it does grab most people eventually that they're just when you start to wrestle with, well, what is all that? And then you start thinking, well, I am bigger than myself. And then you start thinking in spiritual terms, well, maybe there is something more to life. And maybe uh, I should lean towards the good. And maybe we are all one. And if I wrong someone, maybe it is like wronging myself in a sense because we're all connected. Entheogen yeah. use, even in the free range, unadulterated, uneducated setting, it does still open that door to some people and that's better than nothing because otherwise, you know, the people without the entheogens, it would be zero. And with the entheogens, it's maybe a third get there. And the other ones are just mm -hmm. partying, but it's, it's yeah. moving the needle towards people having individualized spirituality and direct experience. Hmm. Yeah. There's also the question of, um, I mean, in the same way it applies to entheogens, is it going to, you know, result in you being a transformed, you know, transcendental, um, spiritual, more spiritual person? Um, there's also that stereotype about NDEs that, um, uh, and it's to, to a large extent, it, it's justified the the fruits of the experiences, as William James would have said, that, you know, you can tell a, a real a genuine religious experience by the fact that it has those positive transformational effects mm. and so many people have NDEs are come back and they're less materialistic and yeah. they're more charitable they might start doing um, volunteer work that sort of thing um, but I've also found some examples that are really interesting 
that defy that. And I'm not sure in, in most of those cases, there's some kind of suspicion that they might not be a real NDE at all. Mm. Like for example, there's a, there was a guy in the twenties, I think 23, 28, um, William Dudley Pelly. And he was um, known as America's Hitler at the time. Oh, I, I've never even heard this he, name. I don't think. Yeah. He's, he's pretty buried in, in the country's <laughs> history. Um, but his NDE was published in some um, popular American magazine, not McCall's, but something like that, like the American readers, you know, just some kind of housewifey magazine. Um, and basically what happened is he claimed to have had an NDE. He wrote a long article about it and it had all of the kind of, you know, typical things. He met angels, left his body, deceased relatives and all that. Uh, and then he saw in the other world things that kind of, um, validated and encouraged him in like racist eugenics type beliefs right. and he came back and became like a, a far right white supremacist leader um to the point that he was known as as america's hitler and that was after his nde so it's not like he had an nde and saw the light and became a better person um but when you read his nde it does seem a little bit like it's a little too good to be true you know it's it's almost like it's cobbled together from different examples that he found mm -hmm. um and then in the the indigenous religions book you might have read one from melanesia i think um where the the guy claimed to have met satan in the other world and and then he came back and founded this um really exploitative manipulative religion where he just kind of took people's money and conned people and um and that also is a little bit dubious because the guy already had a record. So it was, it's, I think in, in those cases, I'm, I'm tempted to think that they're um, opportunists and kind of inventing. They, they might have seen the benefit that other people have, have gotten by, by talking about these experiences and, and thought, hey, this is a good way to start a religion. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to totally rely on that. I don't want to take the path of like, well, they're bad people, so they must not have had a real NDE. Right, right. <laughs> There's exceptions so, to every rule, I but I am kind of with you in that I feel like with those kind of out of body near death experiences of seeing the afterlife, like you are directly confronted with the reality that there's more than this life and that your consciousness continues after your death. So when you know that, like really know it, how do you be an asshole? How do you be a, a, a genocidal maniac? I mean, you just have to be like, well, this is such what happens on this plane seems like such small potatoes compared to what I just experienced. So maybe I should chill yeah. out here a little bit, at least yeah. maybe I don't know everything. It just seems like such a uh, deflator of the ego and deflator of pride and all the, to me, the negative things with, which would lead a person to be that kind of guy. Uh, it's almost right. like just baked right in. But again, you can like lead a horse to water. You can't make them drink. You can show someone truth. And they can still say, fuck that. I'm going to go back and I'm going to do whatever I want. That was a dream. Yeah. Yeah. Although most people who have NDEs, um, I don't, again, I don't want to say universally, but I would say almost universally in the 90s percentage, if not 99%, um, are totally convinced of the reality of the experience. Yeah. Like almost nobody comes back and says, wow, that was a weird dream. Right. Um, you can you can you know, pretend was... to be in denial, I guess, is what I'm saying. But yeah, it's it's pretty clear that it's real. Like at least I think that everyone I've ever heard that's and if you haven't experienced it, it's really hard to say because you have that doubt. You're like, yeah, you say that, but it's like, okay, well, yeah. you've got to experience it. Then you're gonna have to take five grams of mushrooms if you're not gonna have a near death experience in any other way. This is the mechanism where you can control it. You can decide, hey, today I am going to see the other side. Like there are things here yeah. and you have to kind of explore it if you want to know what knowing is like. Yeah, and I think that brings up an interesting distinction between knowledge and, and belief because yeah. people who have had these experiences, to them it's knowledge, um, whereas to people you know, is knowledge. The fact that they had it is real. It's not like they believe in their experience. They, they know that it's true because they had it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's something I don't have, obviously. I don't, I don't have, um, so I can't believe that NDEs are, are genuinely experiences of the afterlife, just as I don't believe that they're not, because I just don't know, you know, I don't have anything to base those beliefs on other than what other people say. And it's the same with, you know, UFO experiences. Like, you know, obviously something weird's going on, something weird's going on with NDEs, but I don't know what it is. Well, <laughs> that's what I was How would I determine that unless I'm, unless I get there myself? Can you believe it, people? A video clip and a peek into how that sweet THC sausage is made. For some people, I'm sure it's nice to put a face to the name, so I started making clips that are a little more YouTube-friendly than the full show tends to be. Get the full show on any podcasting platform. I prefer to keep it audio only so we have a more decentralized distribution for a controversial show, and also so I can edit out the ums and ahs and barking dogs and all the things that happen when a person records in their home environment. And then if you really like the show, you can sign up for THC Plus, and instead of one-hour interviews, you get the full two-hour interview for just eight bucks. I think that's a better deal, more of a win-win than asking you to support the show by booking a therapy session or buying generic Viagra. It's getting weird out there, folks. So just go to the HiresideChats.com or click the link at the top of any set of show notes and all your wildest dreams will come true. All right? All right. The Higher Side Chat Show, Greg Carwood.